This year, the Melbourne Writers' Festival is celebrating its 30th birthday. To mark the occasion, the Wheeler Centre dropped by the festival's 2015 program launch to hear from Mark Rubo. Mark is the Managing Director of Readings, Books and Music and the Founding Chair of the Melbourne Writers' Festival. He spoke about the festival's early days after it was founded in 1986 as a sister festival to Melbourne's Spoleto Arts Festival, now simply called the Melbourne Festival. Here's Mark. I don't know if we had a great vision. I suppose um, Melbourne in the, in those days, it, to me, it was very exciting. It was um, in the early 80s, it was when all the Australia Council money that had gone to writers sort of five or six years before was starting to produce books. We had some wonderful Australian publishers, Di Gribble, Hilary McPhee, and Brian Johns at Penguin, and, uh, and many others. So it was a very exciting period. It was, it was quite a small community. And at that time, the only writers' festival was the Adelaide Festival, and that was every second year. There was nothing else. Um, so it did seem that something should happen. And it, it happened sort of organically and accidentally. I'd um, been involved with the Australian Booksellers Association. We had a, one of our conferences in about 1983, I think, in, um, in Brisbane. And Brisbane at that time, of course, was ruled, governed by Joe Bielke Peterson, and was, wasn't known as a home of culture. <laughs> but um, they had a very good university press, the University of Queensland Press, which published, among us, amongst others, John Updike and Peter Carey and Kate Grenville. And I was speaking to one of the guys from the University of Queensland Press, and he was telling me that they used to have readings by authors at the university, and they would get hundreds, you know, a couple of hundred people along. I thought, well, if that can happen in Brisbane, then surely it can happen <laughs> in Melbourne. So I came back with that idea and started doing things with readings. And then that sort of morphed into we. Um, there was a woman called Mieta O'Donnell, who some of you may remember. She had an institution called Mieta's, which is um, well, up the top of Collins Street, uh, down a little lane. It was the old Prussian embassy, and um, Mieta was looking for um, things to happen in her institution. So she approached me and said, would you like to put on author readings at, at, at Mieta's? And I said, it seemed to me quite an easy thing to do because they would provide the venue and everything. And Meta said, well, look, we'll look after the authors very well. And um, mm-hmm. we were talking before and Peter was telling me how after one of his readings, he was taken upstairs. Meta's had this very high class restaurant upstairs. Uh, the chef was Jacques Renand, who now <laughs> people might have. Um, and the author would be taken upstairs and given this wonderful dinner after their reading. So it was a, it was a great gig for any author. And I did ask that that not be mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all this was bubbling around, and then the Spoleto thing happened, and um, a friend of mine, the late John Pinder, was doing some work for the Melbourne City Council, and he came to me and said, you know, there's you, you writers and all these publishing people, you should do something, and it's not right that, that there's no writing component. And he said, I've got a friend has um, got some work at the Melbourne City Council and he needs to extend his contract. <laughs> <laughs> he, could, he could help you. And his name was Colin Talbot and he was a, a writer. And um, so it sort of came out of that and we sort of cobbled it together very quickly. Uh, we used um, the National Book Council, sort of bec- was our auspicing body. Um, it was run by a wonderful woman called Mary Lord at the time. And we got together a committee. There was Michael Haywood and Peter Craven, Helen Garner, um, amongst others. And in a matter of months, we raised the money and and got the festival going. I had these grand plans. It would be this wonderful, it would beat Adelaide and (laughs) and Melbourne. (laughs) And uh, and, uh, I would keep on suggesting these great authors like Margaret Atwood and etc. And 
none of them would accept. And, <laughs> and Peter Craven, who was very who was edit, editor of Scripsy magazine at the time, was very much into obscure poets, and <laughs> kept on saying, "There's this wonderful poet called August Kleinsaller." <laughs> <laughs> And I'd say, well, no. <laughs> so, but eventually, the only people who accepted were August Kleinsaller and Christopher Loeb. Uh, <laughs> but I should hasten to to um, mention that next year we had um, not only did uh, Benson Hedges, <laughs> but we had um, uh, A. S. Byatt, Angela Carter, Vikram Seth, and uh, and some and. Like that would. <laughs> so it was pretty good. <laughs> so, so the, there was a growth trajectory even then. So, what do you think? What do you think is? I mean, what do you feel has allowed or made the festival grow so dramatically? Apart from extraordinarily good management, of course. <laughs> um, well, that's obviously a great fact. Well, I think it's we did get support from government. Um, I think obviously Melbourne is a city where there's hunger, uh, as evidence from the success of the festival and the success of this institution, um, that people are really interested in ideas and talking about them. And um, Jason Steger asked me the other day, did I think, did I ever think it would ever grow this big? And I sort of, sort of thought about it and said, yeah, it probably did. <laughs> um, and once again, I think, you know, people have done a wonderful job to make it what it is today. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.